Brothers, it's a pleasure to greet you this morning after a beautiful, refreshing rain on a lovely spring morning. I hope you rested well and are ready for a, a full day of ministry. We're thankful for those men who've come and given of their time to be read the biography in your booklets, missionary to France, church planter, and David spoke with great benefit and blessing to us a couple of years ago at the UK conference, and so we're delighted to have him here with us today, and we look forward to great blessing on the word that he brings to us. Before he does that, let's stand together and sing number 66, Glorious Things of the Earth Spoken, number 66. And as we look at the second stanza particularly, we can think of the work of the Holy Spirit in ministering to his church. But number 66, we'll stand to sing, and please remain standing afterwards for prayer. Father in heaven, we come to you this morning rejoicing in your mercies to us in this new day. We thank you that we've been brought safely here. 
that we've been blessed with rest and refreshment and that we can now sit under the ministry of your word. We pray for our brother who brings that word to us and we ask, Father, that you would pour out your spirit upon him, that you would give him liberty and unction and that he may know the empowerment of your spirit, that we may be blessed to go out from this place and to serve. Lord, we thank you for this provision, and we pray your blessing on this time now in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I invite you to turn to Ephesians 5 this morning, and we'll read the text before I say anything else. <clears throat> Beginning at verse 15, but uh, our attention will be on the last half of verse 18. Look carefully then on how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with all your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Just a little disclaimer before we begin this morning. The choice of that text, it was not the organizing committee that had me come from France and uh, preach on Ephesians 5.18 because of the allusion to wine. <laughs> I actually chose the text because of the other part of the verse, and that's what we'll be looking at. First of all, the what of the command, be feel filled with the Spirit. In a way, this is God's master command to us in this new covenant age because there's nothing that we can do in the Christian life if we're not spirit-filled men. Can you be a prayerful man, a man of prayer without being filled with the Holy Spirit? Of course not. And so this command has a capital importance. So much so that until we find out what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit, we should determine that everything else is secondary until we understand what it means. And this, being filled with the Spirit, the Spirit of the fear of the Lord, the Spirit of wisdom, the Spirit that gives love and joy and peace and patience. And if we don't have these things, this is first, isn't it? There's nothing that could be more important to us than this command. It's a daunting command, in a way. Extremely daunting, I feel. Because the Spirit with whom we're to be filled is none other than God Almighty, the one and only. Be, God Himself says, be filled with God. But it's daunting, not in a scary sort of way, it's the goodness of it that is almost overcoming when God himself comes to us and says, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. And fill it in such a way that my own glory and goodness will be known in your life and experience. And so it is a wonderful command. I've entitled this, this message, Living in the Supernatural Now. Sorry, I'm just going to put my timer on here. 
living in the supernatural now because what does it mean for us to be men who are habitually filled with the Holy Spirit? It simply means that there's something supernatural about our lives. There's a supernatural touch. There's something going on in us in all of our struggles and all of our sinfulness that is more than us, that is the divine and the transcendent God who is doing something to us. And it is, it is quite amazing. In one way, we could say that what it really means, the difference between true religion and false, is false religion is a burden we carry. Almost like the guy, the agnostic, that said to the to Christian lady, I would be interested in your faith, except that you Christians seem to carry your faith around, your religion around, like a man carries a headache. He wants to get rid of it, but he can't exactly cut off his head. And false religion is a burden we carry. Baal bows down. Nebo stoops. These, thing, these are things that you carry as burdens, said Isaiah. They cannot save. But I, I, says the Lord, true religion, I am he who bore you from your birth who carried you from the womb. And even to your old years and to gray hairs, it is I who will carry and I who will bear and I who will save. And we say, oh, that's just what I need, isn't it? And this is the spirit-filled life. It is a life in which, yes, we have so great struggles. It is miserable sinner Christianity, as Warfield called it. It's not perfectionism, but it's much better to fight with your sin being borne up by the Spirit, being corrected by a power greater than your own. The timing of the command, the when. You know as well as I do that Paul is actually saying something in the present continuous tense, which means we should really translate this, go on being filled with the Holy Spirit, or be always being filled with the Holy Spirit. And so that tells us right away that this is not the same sort of filling of the Spirit as we see so many times in the book of Acts, in which another Greek term is used, not the same one as here in Ephesians 5.18, in which we have in Acts these sporadic, sudden, often unsought, uh, exceptional fillings of the Spirit for a special task of witness. Uh, not everyone who receives them, they're under the sovereign hand of God, and even one who receives them, not in the same measure one time and another. Elizabeth meets Mary coming to her, and she's filled with the Spirit and prophesies. <laughs> But for that moment, and Terry gave you some other examples, but we're talking about a condition of life, not a conscious experience. It's sort of like, how do you know that you're in a room heated to 72 degrees when you go outside? The two are not against each other. Men who are habitually filled with the Spirit in the sense of Ephesians 5.18 long after anointings of the Spirit and obtain them just as in Acts chapter 4. That's exactly what happened. Spirit-filled men prayed and they were filled with the Spirit. The two are so closely related that I'm going to have a hard time this morning because they bleed over into a, one another. The special filling of the Holy Spirit for service is nothing but a heightened experience of the ordinary, now ongoing filling of the Holy Spirit that we are commanded and called to live in and under and by that blessed working of the love of the Spirit and the love of God for us. So it's a command to all the church about right now, living in the supernatural now. Now let's say, let me just ask this question before going on to the next point, and you can think about it. Would you pastors here say coming into this conference, 
if someone had just asked you, are you a man habitually filled with the Holy Spirit? That's a good question. And you understand that if we can't answer that question, something is drastically wrong. If we have no confidence about the master command and we think we might be habitually disobeying it, what sort of foundation for assured living can there be in our lives? The next thing to consider is the importance of the command. We're trying to deal with ourselves and to say that this is not some elite extra for superior Christians. This is God's imperative, gracious will for your whole church all the time and yourself all the time. But if we're to understand the importance of it, we must go back to the whole book of Ephesians and understand that this is not really something about you and I primarily. It's a command to us, but it's something that is at the very heart of the eternal plan of God to be God and to manifest His divine glory. Now, let's just take a quick survey. There are five times in this epistle that Paul uses the same family of terms that we find here filled. First, chapter 1. Do you remember he says that the church, that Christ ascended, and that the church is his body, the fullness, there it is, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Then we move on to chapter 3, and Paul prays that the Spirit would do what? He would strengthen us in the inner man. Why? So that Christ might dwell in our hearts by faith, so that we might know the love of Christ and be filled, there it is again, to all the fullness of God. This is the central prayer of the epistle, central to God's will for us, and filled to the fullness of God, undoubtedly God the Father here from the context that follows on. When we move to the next chapter, Paul says that um, God's given apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastor teachers to the church so that we can attain to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Here it is again, being filled with the fullness of Christ, now God the Son. And then in chapter five, it's be filled with God the Holy Spirit. But we don't capture it until we go back to a key verse that I haven't mentioned. And maybe you can just look at chapter 4 if you've got your Bible still in front of you, and verse 10. Here we find, referring to Christ, maybe I'll read from 9, in saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above the heavens that he might fill all things. The eternal purpose. Christ died, he rose, and he ascended that he might fill all things. Now, what does that mean? What is that about? We can get an idea if we remember that over and over in the Old Testament, God defines himself as the one who fills all all things. It is the divine prerogative of God to be the one who is such a fountain of living waters, brothers, such a fountain, the only fountain of living waters, that to be without him is to be a dead, dry carcass. To be filled with him, to have his presence, is to be full of life and goodness. And so we read things like this in the Old Testament. Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him? Do I not fill the heavens and the earth? Or in Isaiah 6, the angels crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Or better yet, this verse in Psalm 81. Listen to this. As God identifies the true God, the nature of divinity, as opposed to false gods. He says, there shall be no strange God among you. You shall not bow down to a foreign God. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. 
I am the only one who fills. Blessings abound wherever he reigns. The prisoner leaps to loose his chains. The weary find eternal rest, and all the sons of want are blessed. All that want, all that lack. And so what the scripture is telling us is that when Jesus Christ reigns supreme in the consummation, what does that reign mean? That reign does not mean that he simply exacts obedience of all, but it means that he reigns in the more profound sense of filling all with his glory so that he controls all just as a man filled with joy is controlled and characterized by that joy. Everything will be controlled by Jesus Christ and characterized by his lovely glory. For he is the one who ascended on high that he might fill all things. If we're not being filled, we're stepping out of the main plan of God. Be ye filled. My next point is that the nowness of the Spirit's filling, the fact that it is a reality for us to know now, right now, this truth was a changing, a turning point in the life of several important servants of God in church history. I want to give you three examples if I can. It's 1951. We're in the Swiss Alps. There's a young pastor, he's unknown. He hasn't done much, but he will do much. Literally hundreds and hundreds of people from all over the world will make their way to a little village in the Swiss Alps, and hundreds will be converted through his ministry. His name is Francis Schaeffer, but only after a crisis in 1951. In 1951, he said to his wife, and I quote him, Edith, I feel really torn to pieces by the lack of reality, the lack of seeing the results the Bible talks about, which should be seen in the Lord's people. I'm not talking only about people I'm working with in the movement. I'm not satisfied with myself. And so he told his dear wife, I've got to go all the way back to my agnosticism and see, is the Christian faith even really true? Can you imagine his wife? So for weeks, he walked back and forth in the Swiss Alps. And when it was raining, he walked in a hayloft. And he prayed, and he struggled, and he sought God, and he read the scriptures. And God met him in a special way. And in the preface of his book, True Spirituality, he says this, I saw that there were totally sufficient reasons to know that Christianity was true. But in going further, I saw something else which made a profound difference in my life. I searched through the Bible concerning what the Bible said concerning reality as a Christian. Gradually, I saw that the problem was that with all the teaching I had received after I was a Christian, I had heard little about what the Bible says about the meaning of the finished work of Christ for our present lives. Now hold it, I'm not there yet, but just hold on to the word present. And then if you read in Francis Schaeffer's letters, you, here's what you get in the few years following that crisis, 1954. Events since we have seen each other make me more than sure, more sure than ever, that the Lord is calling some of us indeed to learn that the blood of Christ and the indwelling Spirit of the Holy Spirit, what the blood of Christ and the indwelling Holy Spirit should mean to us in this present life. He gets more specific as he, as he goes on. And in one letter, he says, according to the Bible, we are called upon to live a supernatural life now by faith. And in February 12, 1955, in a letter, he says to a friend, I've been working on a book, Lord willing, its title will be Living in the Supernatural Now. The power of the blood of Jesus Christ 
And out of that, the filling of the Holy Spirit for the Christian, whoever he is, such is that power. So great is the power of that cleansing blood that it puts the filling of the Holy Spirit himself on street level for sinners like you and me. Second example. In 1939 and following, on through, the 40, on through the 40s, and some people say even the 50s, there was a revival, a widespread revival in East Africa. And thousands of people came to Christ in Uganda, in Tanzania, in Rwanda, in Kenya, and other, other countries. And one person connected with the revival writes this. He says, we once asked a missionary from one of the fields in East Africa where the revival had been continuing for so many years, what was the leading feature, as he observed it, in the life of the fellowship out there? Without a moment's hesitation, he replied, living with the risen Jesus in the now, which means living in the power of the Spirit for the risen Christ is clothed with the Spirit and communicates him to the church. Now, one person connected with the revival wrote a little book called Be Filled with Be Filled Now. And he says about this book and about the revival's understanding of the filling of the Spirit, those three words, Be Filled Now, are more than a catchy title. They summarize the heart of the message of grace as it applied, is it applied to the filling of the Holy Spirit. It is not be filled tomorrow when we hope we shall have improved, but be filled now in the midst of our failure and current need, as we are where we are. And after this, the next now. Such an experience of pleasant day blessedness for needy people is only possible as we are given a new sight of the grace of God making every blessing available on street level. Third example. In recent days, one man that's been greatly used of God, and I understand there's some discussion about one of his doctrines, but nevertheless, <laughs> C. John Miller, has been indeed greatly used of the Lord. And out of a crisis in his life came the planning of many churches and a wonderful work in Uganda. And here's what he says. While I was studying the Gospel of John, my mind was challenged by the now character of promised passages like John 7, 37 to 39. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He that believes in me from within him, as the scripture said, will flow rivers of living water. And he noticed the present continuous tense in those and the verbs in that passage too. And he says this, this was a life-changing discovery for me. Not only did it awaken my conf confidence in Christ's availability to help me, but it also began to work in me a new release from my self-dependence and self-effort. Well, so much for the historical part. If I can go on to one more minor point before we come to the, the heart of this message, it's this, that if we fail to live in the nowness of the Holy Spirit's filling, we are really, consciously or unconsciously, refusing to live in the reality of God as the living God. Here's why I say this. We look in the past, and all of us here, we know that God, the Holy Spirit, has worked in a mighty way, don't we? We look at it, and we're, 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 we're so thankful and so full of praise for the Spirit's mighty activity in the church in the past. And we look at the future, and we have hope that the Spirit will be working in the future. But often we tend to think and act honestly as if there's a hiatus in the present. He is the God of the past and the future, 
But he is not the one who was and is to come and is. But the scripture is very careful to tell us, I am the one who was and is and is to come. You could think of it as standing on the edge of a, a flowing river and you look to your left, at least my left, and you see this river represents God. And you look to the past and you see the river flowing toward your present and you see the river's full of water. And you look to the right and you look to the future and there's flowing full of water into the future. But that same exact river flows right through your present. And this is what we often do not really expect and anticipate and live in that anticipation of that present, lordly, nobody stopping him, <laughs> activity of the Holy Spirit of God, the breath of Jesus the Lord. There's an old hymn that said it like this. The Holy Spirit, we must remember, he's wind. He's the wind of God. He's the breath of God. And why were these ter terms used? What is breath and what is wind? Well, it's air and movement. No movement, no wind. God, the Holy Spirit, is never given to us as an inert, inactive, divine person. It is not possible. He is wind. He is breath. And the old hymn says, God is here and here to bless. Got it just about right. But is this what we're expecting in the now? And now I want to get to what I think is the reason why we don't have these expectations. And this is the last point. How do we obey God's command to be filled with the Holy Spirit now? Three prefacing remarks. Are you still with me? Okay. It's a passive imperative. Strange. God commands us about something that we are not to do. <laughs> Somebody else is, we don't do the filling. The Holy Spirit does the filling. How do you command some, someone to obey when it's someone else who has to do the acting? Here's your child, little Johnny. Mom is trying to wash his face. And you say, let mom wash your face. A command to Johnny about something that Johnny's not to do. But what this means is when God says to you and I, be filled with the Holy Spirit, it means God is already, the Spirit is already at work trying to wash your face. <laughs> because you can't give a command to Johnny, let mom wash your face, if mom is not trying right now in the now to wash your face. And so Paul doesn't tell us how to get the Spirit because he's already working to fill us. And the command is comply. He is here and here to bless. <laughs> Second pref uh, prefatory remark, because it's command, a command, the, spirit fill, the filling of the Spirit is not automatic. You have to obey. You know, we can live a life that's not full of the Spirit. Paul says to the Galatians, you began by the Spirit, are you now going to finish by the flesh? Walter Marshall in his old book, the, uh, the, the, what's the title of it? Gospel Mystery of Sanctification. He talks about the fact that we can live out of the principles of the old man rather than living out of gospel principles and the principle of the new man. So we do have to obey. The last prefatory comment is that there is a primary means of being filled with the Holy Spirit and some secondary means. 
And I think it's important to distinguish between these, thing, these two or we get all mixed up. For example, there's one way to get on a horse. There are several things to do to stay on the horse once you're on a moving horse. Okay? Now, there are several things that we must do as the Spirit's filling us to keep in step with the Spirit, as Paul says. And um, I, I'm going to just mention those at the end. But I want us to focus on what is the primary reason and way and door and key <laughs> and path into a life that now is filled with the Holy Spirit in an increasing way. But because, of course, this is, this is not a sort of category where I'm filled, I'm not filled. It's, it's, it's a thing where we're growing in the fullness of the Spirit. He's enlarging our heart more and more to be more full of Him. Okay, primary means. The primary means of being a Spirit-filled man habitually in the now is to believe in the power of Jesus' atoning blood. I want to try to explain why that's true. It's surprising, isn't it? We often think in this way. We think that at conversion, we obtained a first blessing. That first blessing was pardoning mercy, justification, being made right with God, being brought under the blessing and the favor of the living God. And then we think, as we go on, we need a second blessing, and that blessing is power. We got justifying mercy, and now we need power on some other basis. The first blessing came to us by the pure grace of God through the blood of Jesus. It is a Calvary blessing. It flows from our blessed Savior's sufferings and nothing else. He bled it into our lives. But we think now I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit and um, maybe I will be if I'm faithful enough and if I'm yielded enough and if, do you see what we're doing? We're now saying there's a second blessing and it comes on a different basis. Please look with me at Galatians chapter 3. O oh, foolish Galatians, Paul says in verse 1, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Now hold on to that because for Paul, he's going to talk about the Holy Spirit in our lives. But for him, the Holy Spirit is part of the first blessing that flows from Christ crucified. That's why he's saying this. There aren't two blessings on two, two bases. Can you say that in English? He says, let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law because you were faithful enough, because you were yielded enough, because you, 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 or by hearing with faith? Hearing what? Hearing Christ crucified that he took all my sin away, that he took all my demerit away, that by his justifying righteousness so great that he put me so under the favor of God that I get everything. Are you so foolish having begun by the Spirit? Are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you indeed suffer so many things in, day, in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he now present tense who supplies you right now the Spirit and works miracles among you do so by the works of the law or by hearing with faith, by the fact that you're going on believing in, the, in all that justification means, in all the, this is what Schaefer meant. This is why he said, I've come to see the present value of the blood of Jesus Christ, the finished work of Jesus Christ. And if we go to the end of the argument, read verse 13 and 14 with me. He, he, he finishes it all out in this way. He says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who, ha who is hanged on a tree, so that, so you've got Calvary there, Calvary so that, 
Verse 14, in Christ Jesus, a blessing of Abraham, justification, being under the favor of God, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Not, not a second faith, faith that the spirit will come to me. It's faith in the blood that puts me under the favor of God and everything that favor means. Let's put it this way. Haman, in the book of Esther, comes in that day, it's so funny, what could happen to arrogant men. The king says to him, what shall be done for the man who the king delights to honor? Let's put it this way. What shall be done for the man who's got all the king's favor? So Haman just dreams up the best he can think of and well, they'll put a robe on him and they'll run him around town and say, this is the man that the king delights to honor. Brothers, I say to you, what shall be done for the man who is so under the sway of the righteousness of the Son of God that all God's favor, the King of heaven, is his? What could possibly be done for a man under such favor? The fullness of the Holy Spirit. You see, the question, brothers, is really how much do we believe that Jesus Christ is saving Lord of all? And what, I'm, what I mean by that is how much do we believe that his Calvary sufferings put us under the sway of a righteousness so perfect, so glorious, so wondrous, that God will, God will give us anything. any blessing, any sanctifying blessing. I think sometimes that our problem is that we see justification as a bare legal verdict at a past point in time. It is that, isn't it? But hold on just a minute. A door is something I pass through one time, but it all depends on what does that door open up into. And the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ cleansing and pardoning and sin-bearing righteousness and blood is a door that opens us out and plants us and puts us in a world of divine grace, in a world of blessing that is so great. <laughs> we, haven't, we haven't understood that. I haven't. And that is a now blessing. This is why Warfield says the entirety of salvation not only hangs with Paul on justification, but is accomplished in justification. Did you get that? In the world of justification is everything. There's no second blessing. If you are righteous with Jesus' righteousness, you've got it all. Now comply. Be filled. Open your mouth wide. It's the wonder of the fire in the bush. <laughs> Moses turned aside because he couldn't believe it. How could it be that that bush, which represents sinful Israel, could be filled with the Holy Spirit who is like a purifying fire? A pure fire. How could it be that the bush is filled with that fire and not consumed? How could I, because I'm sinful in an ongoing way, Simul peccator. Simul plenus spiritu. At the same time, an ongoing sinner and yet filled with the Spirit of God. And that is the wonder of the saving righteousness of Jesus. That's all it is. I'm not being given this on the basis of who I am. I can't be. I am being blessed in a ridiculous way because his, his blood, Calvary, is so great. And we could say it this way. Pentecost is nothing other than a statement about Calvary. The filling of the Spirit is a demonstration of the greatness of the atoning value of the blood of our precious Savior. Savior. 
So if you say, I can't have the fullness of the Spirit now, dear believing, repenting pastor, I can't really be a Spirit-filled Christian. You're making a statement about Calvary. You're making a statement about the value of the blood of Jesus Christ to put you under God's favor so much that you can be filled with His Holy Spirit. And that is why it's so grave and serious. And that's why we have to fight with all our might to become men who believe in the nowness of the power and the ongoing power of the Holy Spirit provided for our lives. Where the blood cleanses in the Old Testament, do you remember the earlobe and the thumb and the big toe? Where the blood cleanses, the oil anoints. And that's it. And that is how Christ is glorified. That's how he's shown to be Lord. That where my blood cleanses, the Spirit fills. And it's all to my glory. Well, there are secondary means, but I won't get into them. I'll just say simply that as we're being filled with the Holy Spirit, we have to fall, keep in step with the Spirit's power by dependence. And Terry well talked to us about that yesterday. And we grow in dependence, don't we? And it's not a technique to get the Spirit filling. It's a highly moral act in which we penitently cease from man. That's what dependence is all about. And we have to fall in line with the Spirit's path. And the Spirit's path is preoccupying us with Jesus and not with the Spirit. You want to be filled with the Spirit? Stop preoccupying yourself with your sanctification, your inner workings and your spirit. And preoccupy yourself with Jesus Christ. I think of my blessed Redeemer. I think of Him all the day long. I sing, for I cannot be silent. His love is the theme of my song. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy, His child, and forever I am. Let me live there. Keep my mind, O Spirit, fill me, and turn me there, and not back in upon myself or even upon you. And the Spirit's path is... Also, holiness. We want to fall in, keep in step with the Spirit. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And that means that we give ourselves wholly and we watch over our hearts and say, Can I, this is how it helps me. Can I do this thing in this way and still be, still have love, joy? peace, patience, and kindness with my wife, with my family, with my church, even if it's preparing a sermon. Can I do it in this way or am I going to get so stressed and so whatever that now I cannot, then I'm doing the wrong thing. And I'm, I try to watch over my heart and, and I do it poorly, I admit, but this is, what, this is walking in the power and the fullness of the Holy Spirit. I cannot do anything that would take me out of that holiness and that fruit that he imperatively obliges me to live in. And then there's mission. Keeping in step with the Spirit's path is mission, and I'll talk about that. And we, our hearts have to be turned toward worldwide evangelism. Keep in step with the Spirit's pattern, and that's repentance. Brothers, if we're not living a life of repentance, my eye is on, 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 on the clock, Jeff, um, we're not going to make it. Some people think the spiritual life is the, is the roof blowing off. The spiritual life is the bottom falling in. And we go down to the cross. We take the sinner's place again and again and again. This is what the Spirit leads us to do. This is the pattern. And keeping in step with the Spirit's paraphernalia. That's what Terry will talk to us about in terms of the, the means of grace. But uh, brothers, Jesus died and ascended that he might fill all things and thus show how great is the value and the wonder of his saving blood. Let us be filled with the Spirit.
I had forgotten the clock. Let's stand and sing number 33. There are refreshments in the foyer. The book store will be open. And we ask that you be back promptly at 1045.